Good morning and welcome to Velocity Church. My name is Aaron Cavanaugh and we here at Velocity are so glad you decided to join us this morning. Our mission at Velocity is very simple, helping people find Jesus and love God. We want you to know that this is a welcoming community where you can explore issues of faith with authentic people and authentic community. We don't have many rules at Velocity, only three. First, no perfect people allowed. We want you to know that we're all a bunch of very flawed people here. Rule number two, no one stands alone. We believe our faith journeys are best lived out with other people. Rule number three, everyone's story matters. You have a unique and important story and it's worth sharing with others. We'd love to get more connected with you. If you're interested in next steps of faith, getting connected or volunteering, you can do so at velocitychurch.info. We open up God's word every week here at Velocity and we want you to be able to do so as well. If you need a Bible, you can find one at the hub table out in the lobby or you can download an app for your phone. Whether this is your first time here or you've been a longtime member, we're glad you're here with us this morning as we continue to worship God together. Good morning. Happy Sunday. How's everybody doing? You guys ready to worship? We've been waiting all week for you to get here. First song we're going to sing is Salvation is Here.
how lucky we are to have a band like this. Can we just give them a round of applause? One of them might be related to me, but that's okay. Um, so anyway, I'm Adria. We're glad you're here at Velocity this morning. And the message this morning through the music has just, like, the cross was enough. Wherever you are today, whatever you're struggling with, the cross was enough. And that king of heaven obeyed his father, came to earth, died on the cross for the sins of humanity so that we could live knowing a hope that would one day put us with him. That's amazing how blessed we are. We're so glad that you're here this morning. We're glad that you're a part of our fellowship. If you're a member here, part of that obedience to God is giving through our offering. So you can do that in several different ways, including putting money back in our box out in the lobby or, or giving your um, tithes and offerings through our online portal as well, velocitychurch.info, and we hope that you will do that. We also want to let you know about some events that are coming up. This coming Saturday is our work day here at the church. So if you're willing, that's all you need. Come, and there will be some things we can do to help spruce up things around here, and, and there's a list of things I'm sure that we could really use some help getting done, and we hope if you're available and free, you'll come out and help with that. More details on the website as well. And we also want to make sure that you know that our next Moments of Hope, let me double check the date, October 19th. So that is something that we do every other month where we um, get food, make, make meals, and then take them out to the homeless in our local community to help feed them. We ran out last time, so it's definitely something that is beneficial and that is really helping our community. So we hope if you're interested that you'll find out more and help with that as well. As I said again, we're really glad you're here. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, when I have the opportunity to stand with brothers and sisters in you and to worship through your music and learn through the message, Lord, it just it feels so good. It feels so right. And it also breaks my heart for those who don't have that connection with you. And I pray, Lord, that as we sit here and worship together, we can think of ways to share the joy we have in you with those around us. And I pray that you would give us opportunities as we hear the message today 
to take and share your message with those around us. In your name we pray, amen. I, I know many of you have probably heard a lot about uh, the hurricane damage that's happened, especially in Florida and in western, uh, the, the western Carolinas. And if you are wondering, hey, if there's a way that I can help or is there something I can co contribute to, I think it's a good opportunity to mention IDES.org, I-D-E-S.org. IDES stands for International D Disaster Emergency Services. And IDES is an organization, a nonprofit organization that works with Christian churches um, that are in the areas in which damage and destruction happens, and uh, people will uh, be a part of like work crews that go to help for cleanup and repair and that kind of thing. But one of the things they do that's uh, particularly, I think, beneficial and that I really like is that when you give to them for disaster relief, 100% of the proceeds and whatever is given to that goes to that disaster relief. Um, so that none of that is no percentage is taken for administrative costs or anything like that. So 100% goes to that. So if you're looking for a place to contribute or, or want to uh, respond to uh, the disaster that's happening, I mean, some of, some of those areas have experienced record flooding. Um, so uh, just kind of like generational impact uh, kind of stuff that, that has happened. So if you f feel a desire to help with that, I recommend that you check out IDES.org. I, I didn't put a slide up on, for us uh, this morning, but I-D-E-S dot org. Well, this is week two of us in our sermon series uh, called Finishing Well. And last, actually two weeks ago, we talked about having a good start because if you want to finish well, you have to start well. Um, it just kind of, it just works that way. I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. The other thing that really helps, though, is to know where you're going. It's great to have a good start and it's great to want to have a, a good finish, but you also got to, got to know where you're going and you got to stay there. And you would think, that, that should be a little bit easier um, than maybe it often turns out to be. We have, at the, at the school that my kids go to, they have a cross-country team. And one of the races, I think it was last year, maybe it was one of the first races they had, uh, we had some of the kids that were fastest in the, in the leader group, we found out afterwards that they actually ran the wrong direction for their, their race. And I think they were just faster, more ahead of, uh, you know, the, the pack. And so some of the volunteers that were out there weren't, just weren't really prepped and ready to direct them where they were supposed to go. So I don't remember, maybe they ran half a mile more than they were supposed to or something like that, which, by the way, is significant. Um, at least it would be significant for me. Um, and, and their times were a little bit off and that kind of thing. And I think they corrected it as, as you went. But you kind of you hear that and you're like, okay, it's, you know, a small cross-country meet, and, you know, there's some volunteers there, and they kind of drop the ball, but that's okay. We, we understand it, you know, that those kinds of things happen. Surely, for example, it would never happen at, I don't know, one of the biggest 10Ks in the world, right? For example, you know, just, just random example out of nowhere. But if you would think that, you would be wrong, because last year at the Peachtree Road Race in Georgia, 50,000 people come from around the world to run this 10K, it's a big deal. And uh, for the women's elite runner group, the leader of the pack who had won the year before and was obviously the favorite because she was right there at the finish line, was just cruising and right there about to win the race. And in front of her, though, there was a, a police motorcycle escort. And as they were going along, she was running, she was in cruise control, she knew she was towards the end of the, end of the race. This is a real thing that happened, by the way. You can, you can look it up on the Google. She's running, and the, the police officer veers off to the right, pulls off the race course, but she doesn't know that the police officer pulled off the race course. And so she's just trucking along. She's like, all right, I'm just cruising. I don't know why I have a police escort, but this is great. And so I, I follow along with them. Um, she did not win the race. Uh, she ended up being taken off course. I think she recovered enough to come in third place, 
But this person who had a really good time, she was running a great race. I mean, she ended up completely missing. And you think about that, uh, you think about all the feelings that go through that, right? Is, is that, oh, I was, should have been in first, and oh, I can't believe this happened. What's going on? She missed out on the, on the $10,000 prize. Who knows what kind of maybe sponsorship bonuses that she missed out on or just having that mark on her career, you know, where she would have had back-to-back -back victories at this huge major race and it just didn't happen. We would think that, man, nothing like that could possibly happen at something so big and so well organized, and yet this kind of stuff happens in our lives all the time. I mean, things that, things that we, I, I don't know how many times you've had this experience, but there have been plenty of times in my life where I've gotten off course a little bit, and I knew better. I mean, I, I look back and I'm like, man, that was just a dumb decision. And maybe I'm, the, I'm probably the only person in here who's done something like that, gone off course, and even though I knew I shouldn't have, have done that. For some of us, those kinds of things, getting off course in life, I, some of us, it started in childhood. You know, there's something that we heard or somebody said to us or experience that we had, and it just kind of helped us veer off. And I, I don't know if you've ever tried to build or construct something and make sure everything's level and plumb and straight, but you can be off by, I, I don't know, an eighth of an inch, and by the time you get 20 feet down the road, uh, down the road, down the way, you know, you're, you're like five inches off in your construction. You can't build your, build your building. Maybe it happened in childhood. Maybe, you know, you're on your own for the first time, and, and you kind of had to learn some pretty tough lessons. Uh, maybe something has happened in your life to throw you off kilter. All it takes is just one life experience that we don't expect, one wrench that's kind of thrown in the works, and that can really knock us knock us out of place. Finding a starting point and a race worth running with Jesus, I mean, that, that is a huge moment in our lives, uh, but staying on the course with him, that's the most important. Because it's one thing to say we believe in Jesus and that he is our Lord and Savior and that he transforms and changes our, our life. It's a whole other thing, though, to walk with him in our lives. The Bible gives us plenty of parameters for what it looks like to walk with Jesus, but we still struggle. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite social media accounts that, that I follow, um, you might be surprised by this, but it makes fun of people, and um, I, I really enjoy that. And it, uh, it's, it's an account that will take video clips from Christian influencers and preacher clips and uh, point out the theological inaccuracies in a humorous way. You know, that, that people will preach and, and talk about. And you listen to it, and, or at least I do, and I'm thinking, wow, that, that's objectively the opposite of what Jesus says. <laughs> you know, so how, how do we get to this point, and how do we make those kinds of, my, make those kinds of conclusions? How do we get so far off base? Uh, sometimes we just find ourselves not really thrilled with some of the parameters that don't allow us to do what we want. You know, we see, uh, I don't know, maybe in Scripture or the way that Jesus calls us to live, we see some guardrails set up uh, that are things that we don't really appreciate. But guardrails aren't there for restriction. They're there to get us to where we want to go, or at least where we need to go. The race that we want run in life, we don't know the course ahead of time. I mean, none of us have, like, gone into it and said, here's your manual, and here are all the things that are going to happen. Uh, here are the ways that people are going to interact with you in your life. Here are the situations and circumstances that you're going to find yourself self in. Um, but there are some things that we can prep for, and there are some principles and commands in Scripture that can, that can get us ready to face whatever might come our way. And there are people that have gone on before that we can learn from and can be examples for us and insight, but the challenge for us is to keep committed to the course that Jesus sets before us. The path that we've chosen as believers in Jesus, it is a narrow one, but that's only in respect to how broad the world can get off course. The results at the finish line of the narrow path that Jesus calls, calls us to, those, those results aren't narrow. Those are the best we can possibly gain in life. And so I want us to read through 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 this morning. If you have your Bibles uh, with you this morning, uh, you can go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, even if you don't catch me while, while I start reading this text, because we're, we're going to read a few more verses a little bit later on uh, this morning. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing to a young preacher named Timothy, and he's encouraging him to stay on course. And this is what he says. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So this morning, let's reflect on what Paul has to say to Timothy and the insights that God might have for you and me and what it looks like to fall faithfully walk with Jesus. The, the first thing that Paul says to Timothy is, be strong. It's like, oh, okay, sure, I'll, I'll just, yeah, that's what I'll do. Uh, great advice, right? When you're going through something that throws you off in life or, you know, you're miserable and somebody just says, well, just, just be strong. You know, unexpected circumstances are things that kind of throw you off. and It's okay, just be strong. Well, maybe, maybe Paul means something different than what we typically mean when we say that. The strength that he's talking about, uh, by the way, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, is in found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, the strength that is a gift from the Holy Spirit, the power and love and self-discipline that the Holy Spirit gives us as a grace so that we can live, live out what God calls us to in our lives. The true strength that we have comes from knowing what you're about and where you're headed. And that is something that we only find with Jesus because we don't know our race ahead of time. We don't know how things are going to finish out this side of heaven, but God, God does. Do you remember following, playing follow the leader as a kid? Did you, did you ever do this? Or some of y'all were rebels. You're like, no, nah, I ain't following nobody. I'm going I'm to do my own thing. Do you remember that? Uh, do you remember all the like silly things that you would do? I don't know if you had a go-to, you know, follow the leader move. But I think one of the reasons why we enjoyed playing final leader, first of all, is we didn't care as much what people thought about us when we played, you know, on the playground as, as little kids. We were just like, yeah, let's go. This is amazing. We're going to do all this crazy stuff. And one of the real reasons, though, I think we enjoyed playing final leader is that at some point we knew that we were going to be the leader, that we were going to be the one in front and everybody else was going to have to do what we made them do. So I don't know if you're like the ministry of, you know, funny walks or something like that or or, what, uh, or what, you, what you enjoyed to do, but you knew that you're going to be in the position to be able to do that. And the parameters were just simple. As a group, we're going to get together and we're going to cooperate to have fun and accomplish this one simple single task. Well, following God isn't supposed to be actually that much more complicated. It's just more difficult without a childlike faith. Jesus actually directs us. The, the way that we often think about strength is like, oh, I have to develop power on my own so that I can stand up uh, uh, under things and I can carry things on my own shoulders and I can deal with things myself because I'm independent and I'm strong and I don't need nobody else. You know, that I can be my own leader. I can be the person in the front, in the front of the line. And yet the way that God gifts us the love and grace and mercy through Jesus and desires for us to experience that in our life is for us to be able to just trust him and be and remain not in the front of the line and follow him and allow him to show us where we are meant to go in this life. In Matthew chapter 18, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's in the front of the line? And Jesus calls a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Jesus is not saying that children, because of who they are themselves, are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's because the characteristic that they show, the trust and the hope and the faith they have in the one who leads them, that's what makes them great. Because our greatness and our strength doesn't come from ourselves, it comes from our Creator and our Savior and our Lord. The strength that we're meant to develop is found in the grace given to us by Jesus. And that's what Paul tells Timothy. He doesn't just say, be strong. He's like, okay, I'll, just, I'll, do what, I'll do what I can in this moment. He says, be strong in the grace given to you by, by Jesus. Trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior means following him in the direction he leads, even if we don't, and, and especially if we don't understand how it gets us to where we know he is taking us. You think about, I mentioned guardrails before, think about how guardrails work. No one looks at guardrails and says, oh, that's so unfair. I just, I, what if I want to drive in the trees? <laughs> I, I, so, I don't know what it's like to, you know, drive off a cliff. 
and, and this is just so restrictive for me because it doesn't allow me to go where I want to go. I don't want to get off at the exit. I want to drive through that farmer's field. You know, I don't know what it's like to crash my car through a, through a fence. And so I, I just want that life experience because, you know, I, it's just not, not how we think. But that is kind of how we act, though, sometimes, especially willingly. We know, hey, this is kind of set up as a primary principle command in Scripture, and we're still like, well, I don't know, maybe I'm the exception to the rule. We're, we're, you're not, and I'm, and I'm not. It's just not how that works, and that's how, we get off, that's how we get off course. And so Paul tells Timothy, be strong in the grace of Jesus. A strength to be courageous to follow the narrow way of Jesus so that we might take hold of life that is truly life. Remember, it's not based on our own strength and ability, but through the sustaining work of the Holy Spirit that we rely on to guide us. But because we aren't kids, and because we are bigger and can make more decisions because somebody arbitrarily decided we can, because we don't really act much different than children, let's, let's be honest. The way we live our life and the direction we go in, go in doesn't just affect us, it affects everybody around us as well. The second thing that Paul tells Timothy is he says, entrust what you've been taught to others in verse 2. If you care about knowing something well, especially like the course that you're on or the direction you're going in, attempt to teach it to someone else. As Christians, Jesus actually commands us to do this. He says, go and teach Go baptize and teach people to do everything that I've commanded you, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. I don't know if you've ever had to teach anything in your life, um, but it takes, some, it takes some effort. It takes some preparation. It takes some familiarity with the material. You know, somebody can just give you a curriculum to go read to somebody else and present to someone else, but unless you know the subject material, you're providing an incomplete knowledge base. And as soon as somebody has, I don't know, a question that you haven't considered or something or addresses something you're not aware of, you're, you're lost. It's no different than taking your car. Have you ever done this before? Taking your car to a mechanic who knows how to read codes, but like doesn't actually know how to diagnose the problem with your vehicle. Have you, have you had that happen? I mean, I have. If it's, it's not great. There's a huge difference between somebody who can plug up a code reader to your car and say, well, it's saying this, 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 and someone who can take your car, drive it for five minutes, listen to it run, and say, you know what? This is, this is what's causing the problem. Because a lot of times we're more aware of the symptoms but not the root cause and issue. We can say, oh, I'm in the guardrail, <laughs> or now I'm in the trees and the road is over there. Well, how did I actually get to this point is the real issue, so we can avoid that next time. Being a reliable person to be qualified to teach others requires a level of consistency and staying on course for the long haul, and this is how we best understand who we are in Jesus. You wouldn't go train for a race with someone who's never competed in one or no, uh, someone who's never completed one. You wouldn't seek out direction from someone who isn't putting into practice what, what they believe. You and I should desire and pursue being reliable sources who life tra- whose life trajectory points toward, Jesus, toward where Jesus leads. The spiritual transformation that Jesus gifts us with will require adjustments and unlearning what we have learned on our part so that we can be sure that we are sharing directions to Jesus with others rather than some other destination. And the way to become most familiar with that path that Jesus has for us is when we are prepared enough to lead others along with it, lead others along with us. And, and I know some of you might think, ah, there's, there's nobody following me. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. There are people in your life, within your family, within your community, within your workplace, within your neighborhood, there are people who, there, there are people who are impacted by your very existence and influence in their life. And so it, it, it matters which direction you're going because it matters for those other people. You know, it's not easy to take on this kind of responsibility in your life. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it takes hard work, and Paul recognizes this. And so the next thing he tells Timothy in verse 3 is he says, embrace the challenge. Except he doesn't actually say that. <laughs> He doesn't say embrace the challenge in verse 3. If you have your Bible open, you you know and remember what he says. He says, join me in suffering. Okay. I'm sure Timothy is reading this letter from Paul and like, 
man, he just always knows what to say. It's so, in, so encouraging. I know this is going to sound wild, but there are people who do things that are hard on purpose. I, I mean, there are. They're, I think they're crazy. Um, just to challenge themselves to see if they can complete it. Do you know, I, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with running, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick you know, with, with the example. Do you know there are things called ultra marathons? So there are marathons, right? There are 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons. A marathon is 26.2 miles. Um, I've never run one, but it's because I know how long it is. (laughs) There are these things called ultra marathons because there are people out there that are like, 26.2? That's that's not nearly enough. So uh, an ultra ultra marathon is typically defined by something that's 50K or longer. Um, A friend of mine just recently ran an ultra marathon, but not just anyone, uh, she went and ran it on a mountain, right? Because it's not not enough to just run it on a road a long way, but you like want to climb a mountain as as you're doing it. My father-in-law actually just finished this morning, early this morning, a 24-hour run this weekend, and I I have no explanation. (laughs) I I don't, I mean, if you're looking at me for answers, I I have none. I, I don't understand. I don't understand it at all. Um, and I know, uh, I know you'll be skeptical that stuff like that actually happens, but it, it was on purpose. He actually, he actually knew about it. When Paul tells Timothy to join him in suffering, I think about those kinds of things, and I wonder, you know, how many of you this morning, if I said, you know what we're going to do, you know, this week? Let's sign up for an ultra marathon, you know, or like, let's just sign up for a 5K. Um, I think, I think that would be a very small, small group. <laughs> um, hey, buddy, we're not going to go with you to a place you've obviously never been, <laughs> you know, in your life, a uh, little self-deprecation there. But also, most people just want to avoid that level of suffering. That's not something that we, you know, wake up in the morning like, all right, it's Monday, I'm ready to join Paul in suffering. There is suffering that's worthwhile, though. Paul describes this a little bit further in this chapter, which I'm going to read here in just a minute. Uh, you might not want to start training for a marathon this week because you want to avoid the physical exertion and the soreness and the time commitment, but you and I both know that if we don't make some sort of physical activity a priority in our life, the long-term suffering of our health will be much worse than the short-term discomfort that we feel in the moment of that physical training. Everyone, everyone's fighting a battle, um, but not all of those battles are necessary or worthwhile or ones that we should be putting ourselves in positions to have to fight. That's why Paul says that soldiers aren't meant to get caught up in civilian affairs. Like, no, you, you stay on mission, stay on course. He says that athletes, if they want to experience the fruit of their labor, they have to compete by the rules. Otherwise, you completely ruin your chances of achieving your goal, tarnishing your reputation, getting all of your achievements taken away from you. Keep in mind, as Paul is writing this, in the ancient world, like the month-long preparation for the Olympic Games, the rules of competition didn't just apply to the competition itself. It also applied to the training. You had to train in a particular way. In this text, you can see that Paul is, is um, he's doing away with the reductionist view of Christianity being just a subset of rules that one could apply to life as a way of manipulating certain outcomes. He's acknowledging that a type of suffering will accompany faithfully following Jesus. It's not just about trying to get what we want out of God and out of life. Instead, he's advocating for the result of a comprehensive life and worldview transformation that provides the spiritual discipline needed to stay on course. The metaphor of a soldier performing his duties and an athlete competing according to the rules paint the picture of a rule of life. As you read the Bible, you recognize some themes and patterns of spiritual discipline that help us stay the course. Uh, Richard C. Foster writes one of my favorite books on this. It's called Celebration of Discipline. If you want to pick that up, see if your library has it. I would highly recommend it to you. Um, He identifies three different categories of spiritual disciplines, um, of ways in which that maybe some of us, you know, think that are suffering, you know, but they're actually uh, us working out our salvation in the way that God calls us to. Inward, outward, and corporate. It's it's on the screen, so you can see those there. But just as an example, I'll read the first one. Inward, meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. Like, these are things that help us 
to stay on course. They help us to be strong. They help us to know how we entrust what we've been entrusted to to others, and we know what direction we're heading to. And while we have to prioritize this and spend time on this, and it takes time and it takes effort, and sometimes, you know, I, I hear this plenty. Um, it's, oh, man, reading. You know, I just don't enjoy reading or spending the time and doing that. Um, well, choose, choose your suffering. Because on the one hand, if, if you don't know what God says, then you're not, not going to know how to apply that in your life. And you're not going to know why you're off course. And you're not going to know why you keep running into trees versus walking with Jesus on the narrow path to which he calls us to. If you don't put your effort toward what is true, what is noble, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy, then the energy that you expend will leave you no less spent, but with far less hope to show for it than when we apply ourselves to the ministry of the gospel. The final metaphor that Paul uses here in this section in verse 6 it's just the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Like, there's fruit from the labor that is evident in our life. You don't enjoy the fruits of your labor as a farmer if you don't follow established good practices to grow crops. In other words, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, the, there's some things that are going to be difficult, but the difficulty is worth it. There's value in that because of what it produces. And so recognize that in your life. The question for us is, what is the fruit that is being born with the path that we're walking with Jesus. You know, Paul's t- talking to Timothy, a preacher, like he's got this obvious ministry, right? He's like, well, he's leading a church, so there, that's kind of... Well, you have no less of an obvious ministry in your life. At least not, not to which, you know, God hasn't given me like a more important calling, for example, than you. And so what, is, what does the fruit look like that's being born in, in your ministry, in your life, in the church, and in the community of people that you're surrounded with? Because God's calling you to these same things that Paul is reminding and encouraging Timothy in. Applying strength, teaching others, embracing the challenge of staying in the race, it's not a theoretical practice. It's not about just belief, but it's about an applied theology and practice. Our motivation for staying the course and following the right direction is found in the following verses of 2 Timothy chapter 2 is a reminder of the gospel and to be inspired to keep staying on course. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, remember Jesus Christ. So all these things that I'm telling you, all the things I'm trying to encourage on you, th- this is the motivation, this is the why. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he will also, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Even when we do find ourselves inevitably and invariably off course, we still know how to get back because God will be always be right where he says he will be and always ready to walk alongside of us. When we are unsure of how to apply the gospel to our lives, we're going through a particular challenging situation. Someone says or does something that shakes us or distracts us and we veer off course. It can kind of seem like a maze. You know, we, how, do, how do we get out of this so we can get back to where we need to go with, with Jesus um, as a kid, I, I had a very specific um, approach to mazes. Did you ever do the mazes that they gave you at a restaurant? You get a little crayon, and I think they, they had those when I was a kid. Maybe I'm just thinking about when uh, my kids, back in my day, we went to a restaurant. Uh, we didn't have coloring pages. So we had sm- smoking and non-smoking, you know. <laughs> it's just a little bit different. So maybe I'm just thinking about my own kids' mazes and coloring pages that, that we did, or, or in school, you know, when you did that. What, what was your, did you, did you have an approach to that? Like, how, how did you, I had a very specific methodology for solving a maze as quickly as possible. You know what it was? Start at the end. You start, you start at the finish, and you go back to the beginning. You know, the runner who missed out on that 10K that I mentioned at the beginning, I read the article about that. She didn't get a very good look at the finish line before the race, apparently. Because, you know, like elite runners, they, they go out and track the course. But she said she didn't get a good look at the finish area. Um, I don't know if she was saying that, you know, it wasn't w- well marked out 
for the runners or, or what, what the reason is, but she didn't get a good look at it. So undoubtedly, this contributed to her confusion at the end because if she had a clear picture of where the finish line was and how she needed to get there, she would have had a complete understanding of how to stay on course. Well, that's what we get from knowing when we start a life with Jesus. We, we get the finish line, a full picture of the finish line, because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection continues to be a living sacrifice for us that ensures that we finish well with him. All he asks us to do is stay on course, is, is to walk with him, to live the life that he created us to live, because he wants the best good that can be had for each and every one of us. You know, Paul identifies in this text, he says, I, I'm in prison and chained, but he knows that his imprisonment isn't only false because he's been wrongly chained, but that in the race set before us by God, no one can take us off course if we keep our focus on him. Paul writes something that addresses this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all long, all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when we have started our life with Jesus, we started well, we've said yes, belief, repentance, confession, baptism, faithful living, that's the start line for us. As the symbolism of our sin being washed away means that we know that the finish line looks like the faithful obedience. It comes about by the faithful obedience Paul tells Timothy to endure in. Strength within the grace of Jesus. You and I have the strength, knowledge, and courage to stay consistent in our walk with God because the Holy Spirit sustains the grace and mercy of Jesus in our lives. And we can stay the course with Jesus and know that there is no wasted effort when we endure with him, and when we walk with him. Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for the reminders that you give us in your scripture, and thank you for the opportunity that we have to read it more than once, to, to continually be reminded of it, because there's so many things that seek and threaten to take us off course, to garner our attention, to distract us. And we just ask that you help continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit to, to walk consistently with you. Help us to, to be in your word. Help us to walk with fellow followers of Jesus so that we can, we can finish well. God, we ask that you continue to guide us and direct us. Give us wisdom uh, when we aren't sure what the next step forward looks like. And help us to have courage and strength to be able to take it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every week at Velocity, we remind ourselves of the motivation you know, that Paul reminds Timothy of as he talks about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We do that by taking communion together. A communion is a time where we recognize uh, that we need a Lord and Savior and that that need has been fulfilled. And so we have a couple different tables around the room that have trays on them that have a couple cups stacked together, uh, bread and juice that represent Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. And so let's share in that time of, of taking communion together right now.
Please stand and sing with us.